Please feel free to use the question feature in your GoToWebinar control panel. Just type in your questions at any time and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Gavin, I'll turn the webinar over to you now and thank you for being here. No problem. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Thank everyone on the line for coming and uh, tuning in and um, thanks to those people I know that have been tweeting about this. Um, I hope everyone can see the screen. There's a, there's a picture of a nervous looking presenter um, and everyone can hear me clearly. I'm, I'm not sure on, on this webinar how I can tell that, but I'm sure you'll kind of raise your hands and let Sharon know. Um, this webinar is Finding Your Powerful Point. Better presenters win more business, get promoted, and create a following. And I'll start with this. If I asked you a very simple question, if I asked you to write down the name of the best presenter you've ever seen, who would you write down? Maybe it would be someone like Steve Jobs. Um, a man that is so good at presenting, he hasn't just had books written about him, he's had books written about how he presents. Or maybe it's someone like Scott Adams. Scott Adams uh, is the, the creator of Dilbert. If you've ever seen him in a, in a seminar or, or giving speeches, he's not just a great cartoonist, but he's a, he's a wonderful speaker. Or maybe it's someone else. Maybe it's someone you've met along the way. Maybe it's your CEO. Maybe it's um, a, a colleague that you, that you work with. The question is, what makes those uh, speakers so good? If I answered that question and thought about who's the best presenter I've ever seen, uh, for me, the answer is pretty simple. The answer is Rose. Uh, Rose is my business partner. Um, we've worked together uh, delivering strategy workshops and leadership sessions for nearly 12 years now. And she's one of those very natural storytellers who can do five minutes on anything, and she literally can have you eating out of the palm of her hand. If I had to grade her, I'd give her an A triple plus at presenting. She really is that good. And for me, I'd say I'm a solid C minus, or at least I started off that way. I'd like to think I've got a little bit better. But I started off that way really because I'm the product of an English education system and I'm an engineer. So if that's true, when if you're, you basically don't have to speak in school for 18 years, and if you're an engineer, you value penmanship over personality. And public speaking is just something you just don't want to do. It's a big no-no. And that gap, the gap between A triple plus and C minus, is, uh, is really annoying, especially if you have to go right on after that A triple plus person. So I, in my journey, I've, I've tried to do what I think anyone would want to do in that situation. I, I try to learn to present better. And I went to things like Toastmasters and checked out classes in Dale Carnegie. And what I ended up doing was being told to stand up straight and don't mumble and don't jingle the coins in your pocket. And standing in a room, in the middle of a room, yelling like Tarzan, which is a very uncomfortable feeling, or at least it was for me. So with all that work, I probably moved from a C minus to a C plus, still pretty average. So I asked myself another question. What makes great presenters so good? What makes the likes of Steve Jobs so good? What makes Scott Adams so good? What makes someone like someone else that you've met along the way, whoever it is that you think is a great presenter, what makes that person so good? And if we did a highly scientific survey, um, you, it would probably come out something like this. I'll bet you practically no one would say, well, they're really good because they don't jingle any coins in their pocket. There might be a few of you that would put your money on something like, well, that person has great stage presence, or that person has wonderful charisma in the way they do things. But I think there would be a lot of you that would turn around and say, well, the, the common thread between all these good presenters is they're really authentic, they're really passionate about what they talk about, and they come across as very natural. And this is all very good. But take it from me, it's very hard to pretend to be authentic it's really difficult to fake passion. And it's practically impossible, or I've been told to do it a lot of times, to act natural. I know I can't be like Rose. And in case you haven't already figured it out, you can't be like Steve Jobs. So here's the big question. If you're not the second coming of Steve Jobs, who are you? And that question really, in some ways, is very simple. You're you. And you're probably very good at being you, but how does that connect to this idea of being a better presenter, winning more business, getting promoted, and creating a following? You 
you may think, well, okay, I can be me, but how does that help? How does it get me to uh, win more business? Well, it's, it's kind of simple. Only you can be authentic, passionate, and natural, and you can only do it if you're you. And that's the key to being a great presenter. If you can be your best on a sales pitch, you can close more deals. If you can present your operations review well, and I'm assuming here that you're actually okay at your day job, you're more likely to get promoted. And presentations are one of the few leadership moments that you can actually plan for. They're a moment where you can create a following. So today, we're going to talk about your favorite subject, which is you. As a presenter, you're one of six presenter types. Uh, the storyteller and the coach, the counselor and the teacher, and the coordinator and the inventor. So if you look at these six types, storyteller, coach, counselor, teacher, coordinator, inventor, every one of them has different natural strengths and biases. Every one of them prepares differently, and every one of them works and handles the room slightly differently. Um, in our travels, many senior executives and CEOs we've come across have been storytellers and coaches. And most of the people that we come across, most of us, <clears throat> are actually coordinators and inventors. But that doesn't mean that if you're an inventor, you should try to be like a storyteller. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know I shouldn't try and be like Rose. If you understand your type, you understand you a little better. And then you can use your natural strengths and biases to present better. And you can prepare in a way that works best for you. You can collaborate with other people more effectively. And you can cut down the amount of time it takes to build a deck. And you can cover your weak spots better and better handle room. But you can only do it if you play to your strengths and understand your weaknesses. And that's what these types are all about. You have to be you. <clears throat> so understand your type. You understand you a little better. And you can use those natural strengths and biases to present better. You can prepare in a way that works for you. You can build decks more effectively. You can better handle a room. <clears throat> We're going to explore each one a little further. And I'll speak about how each one works in presentation mode, if you like. And we'll draw out their strengths and weaknesses. And then I'll pick out a couple of things that each one of the, each of us can do to get better on their feet, depending on the type that you are. There is one caveat. As we go through this, it's going to be very likely that some of you will identify with some of the different traits we're going to talk about. And at the end, you might say, well, I'm a mixture of a storyteller and an inventor. And we have a little self-diagnosis tool that you'll get to know exactly what you are at the end. So let's start with a storyteller. If you're a storyteller, you're a natural speaker who talks with feeling and rhythm. And it seems like you can do five minutes on any subject. You win over an audience really easily, and you use powerful and emotive words, typically speaking about what needs to get done. And you'll embellish and add depth and detail through story and experience. If you, you can do this, it's a great gift. And these are the types of people that you know, if you thought about that first question, who's a good presenter or who's the best presenter you've ever seen, they're typically the type of people that get written down. They're the type of people you look to and you wish, well, I wish I could be like that. And they have a natural talent to be good on their feet and it allows them to rise to the top in organizations. But storytellers have a downside. Left unfettered in their kind of natural state, they can be very unstructured. Um, for example, we work with the CEO of a major global advertising and marketing agency, and we'll call him Bill. We'll protect the names of the innocent. And like many other CEOs and executives, he's a storyteller. So he does a lot of kickoffs in town halls, and he's good. If you go into one of those kickoffs or town halls, and you ask a participant, how did that go, the conversation would go something like this. How was Bill? Oh, Bill was brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. He's great. And they would go on about how great a speaker Bill is. And you ask him a second question. You say, well, what did, what did he talk about? Oh, you know, the future of the agency, where marketing's going, everything else. And we know, by the way, that Bill's actually given some very specific things to do. So you ask that question. Well, what did he specifically ask you to do? Uh, hmm. Ooh, well, I'm 
not sure, but but he was really good. He was he really got us all going. And that's the trouble. Bill's a great speaker, and he's very artful with words. He tells great stories, and he can engage and interact with the audience. But he's not so good with structure. In fact, he's all over the map. And that, that's typical of a lot of storytellers. If Bill speaks in front of a map or a very rich picture, it would allow him to engage and allow people to track and flow, the, the, track the flow and structure of his presentation. And then he's at his absolutely engaging best. Because he can literally be all over the map, but people can follow along. And that's, that's the idea of how PowerPoint can work for him, how presentation can work for him. If he doesn't have that map, people find it very difficult to follow along. And that's what a storyteller is like. Similar to a storyteller is a coach. Um, they also struggle a little bit with structure. And like storytellers, you often see them in senior leadership positions because they are naturally very good communicators. And as you might guess, from the name. Coaches are really extremely energetic. They're very personable speakers. They're great at connecting and engaging people, uh, and they do it by doing and role playing. They're much better live than remote. If they're over the phone, they can quickly kind of lose what's going on, and they lose passion and enthusiasm if they have a low energy audience that they're speaking to. They're usually very, very passionate about the uh, uh, topic, and they let that shine through. And you can almost tell who's a coach. Um, if you watch people before a presentation, you can know who the coaches will be, because they will be the ones pacing on stage or up and down a corridor, and they'll have a script clutched in their hand. And they'll be mumbling to themselves, trying to commit it to memory, trying to commit that skip, script to memory. <clears throat> so if you follow, I know, I know we've got some people from overseas, from uh, outside the US on the phone. <clears throat> but if you do follow American politics, you saw an example of a coach. Um, during the Republican primary debates, there was a great example of a coach in action. Early on, Rick Perry was heavily favored as the Republican nominee. And then on the 9th of November, at the 9th Republican Party presidential debate, he made a horrific gaffe, which basically took him completely out of the running. Before the debate, you could see him on TV, and he was waiting in the wings, laughing and joking, slapping backs. And his various opponents were kind of looking stoic and determined. And then he got out there. And then he was asked a very structured question. What were the things he would do to trim government waste? And I apologize with my accent. I can't do a Texas twang. But he was looking at Ron Paul. And he said, I'll tell you, it's three agencies of government when I get there that are gone. Commerce, education, and the um, <clears throat> um, What's the third one there? Let's see. And he, and, he, and he lost it. And from there, he basically was out of the race. Now, to be fair, PowerPoint is not allowed in a presidential debate. Maybe sometime in the future it will be. But notes are, and a little help on structure for a coach is a note, like a list of the three agencies of government you're, taking, you're, you're going to talk about. That can go a long way. So, Maybe you might think after that example that <clears throat> coaches are the only ones that make mistakes like that. Believe me, that's not true. And if you're feeling bad because the Rick Perry Association, don't despair. You know, if you see someone like Steve Barmer, the CEO of Microsoft, he's a coach too, and he's not doing that badly. But this idea that coaches and storytellers struggle with structure. Structure can be fixed. And after we've wrapped up these types, I'll give you a few pointers on how. The third type of presenter is the counselor. They don't have a problem with structure. In fact, they speak in a very structured way. A classmate of mine in graduate school was nicknamed Speaks Like Books. And if he was asked a question or spoke in front of an audience, he'd have a very rational, very well thought out and structured argument or response. And it, and it really did sound like he was reading from a textbook whenever he gave an answer. This ability to speak to structure is what makes counselors such eloquent speakers. And they like to talk about ideas. They have typically very accurate and organized talk tracks. And they have this relentless stream of logic that's very easy for people to follow. And they can move easily from big picture, 30,000 feet, strategy and vision, right down the way, all the way down to detail and tactics and what's going on. And they have this great command of, of of the content that they have. The downside for counselors is that they 
they struggle a little bit. The skill that allows them to make the same presentation, this skill that they're very structured, allows them to make the same presentation to an empty room as to a large audience. The dress rehearsal will be exactly the same as the live show. It, it won't matter what's going on in the room. But because they're more engaged and with the content in the or than the audience, they can sometimes fail to connect, and they fail to engage, and they fail to feed off what's going on in a room. Because while they're very structured, and they have a great command of language and phrasing, it will tend to be more technical than emotional. It will tend to be more cerebral than it will be smart. And the audience doesn't see itself in the picture, and the counselor doesn't interact and engage, and they'll use big words where they're not required. From a counselor, you won't often hear personal stories or experience, and, rather than, and they won't use metaphor to illustrate. They'll typically provide a more clinical description of whatever they're talking about. That's the counselor. The teacher is the fourth type. And they also struggle with not painting a rich picture for audiences to engage. But like counselors, they can easily get complex ideas across. They tend to use more figures of speech and metaphor. And they're very well-structured speakers. And they can carry, and I envy this um, ability, but they can really carry a very long talk track in their head. That's impossible for me to do. But Teachers can do it really well. But again, <clears throat> teachers tend to put the importance of the material over the interaction and engagement with the audience. And because of that, they can sometimes inadvertently disconnect. They can miss nonverbal cues, and they become more distant. Sometimes the visuals they use are overly complex. Uh, they're simple for them to understand, but for us, the rest of us in the audience, they look like a wiring down diagram, and they're difficult to understand. But counselors and teachers can also easily pick up a few tricks to engage and paint rich pictures for the audience. So we've gone through four different types so far, storytellers, coaches, counselors, and teachers. And they make up the minority of presenter types. In our experience, it's less than 20%, roughly, of the, of the population. Um, they have a natural ability to present, and that natural ability ranges from excellent to really, really pretty good, very competent in what they do. Um, and like I say, the, the coaches and storytellers tend to, because of that ability, climb higher in organizations. And it's not surprising you see them in public office. If I had to give you a few names so you could reference them in your head, uh, you can see executives in action if you follow politics. Mike Huckabee or Newt Gingrich, for instance, are storytellers. And you can see that by the way they engage and interact and feed off audiences in debates and conference speeches. And they literally do tell stories all the time. Uh, we've already talked about Rick Perry and, and uh, Steve Barmer. They are coaches. And you can see that by how energetic and engaging they are, both as individuals and, and with large groups. And I think you know, if I had to place them, I would say both Obama and Romney are counselors. Uh, they have very structured ways of speaking. They, they can engage. They're very good. And uh, they're very good orators, both of them. But they're, they're more structured in the way they speak. They're not the type that will tell stories or slap people on the back so much as they, uh, as they engage with people. And then there's the rest of us. And the rest of us are this big you know, white circle here. And for the rest of us, there's a Gallup survey few years ago um, where we really don't like public speaking. In fact, we would prefer to uh, climb up tall buildings, handle spiders, get injected with needles, and fly than we would speak. The only thing that's scary are, are snakes, and I can kind of agree, that, agree with that. But most of us don't like public speaking. And I think most of us are the other two types, inventors and coordinators. Roughly 8 in 10 of the people we come across are inventors and coordinators. I'm one of them. I'm an inventor. We don't struggle with structure. Uh, we don't struggle with picture, pictures. We don't struggle with engaging. We struggle with something that's far worse. We struggle with words. And both inventors and coordinators would actually rather be in the audience than present. And because of that, coordinators and inventors are typically the worst abusers of slides. You know, excuse me for the pun, but we sweat bullets at the thought of having to give a presentation. 
And we're the ones that are so worried about getting up and saying something that we work really hard on slide decks and work over the detail and sweat over the detail. We worry that we might not remember that key point or that magical phrase. So what we do is we make sure that it's covered in detail on the slide, and then we fret that we can't remember the flow and sequence of what we want to say. So we make sure there's plenty of bullets on the slide. And that, that just ends in disaster. Let's talk more about at least the good side of coordinated inventors. If they have to, a coordinator will give a very um, organized and well-structured presentation. Like I said, they'll naturally prefer to be in the audience rather than the presenter. Uh, but they can pull off a well-organized, well-structured presentation, and they'll need to move and gesture a lot as they speak. And that rule that you get from presentation class about standing still and not fidgeting, it's awful for them. They, looking up and making eye contact is difficult. The slides are, that they use are typically visually meticulous. They're very neat and well-organized. And when they work well, they trigger this well-thought-out talk track that they have. The, the worst mistake that a coordinator will do, and you'll see this in someone that's uh, more, in, more in their natural state, let's say, is they use slides like a teleprompter. Because they're so worried about the words that they need to say and what they need to remember, they forget. And so they'll put everything down on a bullet and literally read everything down. It's your classic uh, uh, death by PowerPoint. Inventors are, are a little different. Inventors are very good at connecting ideas, and they build logical sequences. They really would not rather be up there presenting. They're much more comfortable working in Q&A. I hope I get a lot of questions at the end, because it's much more comfortable for me to answer the questions than it is to go through this. And they definitely, definitely like to prepare their own deck. If you hand an inventor your deck and say, I can't make it to the meeting in Chicago. Can you go? Here you go. They'll probably say yes because they'll want to do your good deed, but they really will not be happy. They like to work off their own material. And if they can't do that, they'll heavily rework something to make it their own. The biggest problem, like I said, <coughs> for inventors is that they have this struggle with words. And they have difficulty holding this long talk track in their head. So they're the type of people that if they get into a conversation or an argument, um, they'll think of the right thing to say, the pitch perfect, Hollywood script thing to say, but it'll only it'll be 13 hours later, because they're just not that facile as they go through. And usually that 13 hours later thing will happen just when they're waking up. And, and that's the problem. They know and fear that there is really an eloquent phrase out there, or a way of saying it, or a great fact, or a number. And trying to remember that, trying to commit that to memory while in front of a group of people is where they know it can all go horribly wrong. Because they struggle with words, and being put in that position where they have to search for words is a huge fear. It's right above heights and small spaces. And, the reason, and that's the response. They grip the lectern, and they have the white knuckles, and they read every bullet in great detail, and read word for word from the paper. So those are the six presenter types, storyteller, coach, counselor, teacher, coordinator, and inventor. And I briefly went through each one. And each one of them has an upside and a downside. And like I said before, you, you don't want to try and, if you're an inventor and you say, well, that doesn't sound as good as a storyteller. I need to be a storyteller. It really doesn't work to try and do that. All the improv training in the world won't really help you um, get, won't, won't change what you are. You have to be you, and you have to know what you are good at. And you have to know what you struggle with. And then you have to know, how do I help that? How do I get better at structure? How do I get better at pictures? How do I get better at words? That's what we're going to talk about. Because really, if you think about PowerPoint, think about it as a double act. And it may not be PowerPoint. It may be whatever presentation helper you use, whether it's uh, you know, a slide carousel or keynote, or you're using pencil and paper. It really doesn't matter. You're a double act, just like you know, Marvel the Magician or Batman and Robin. And what you have to do is you want to get PowerPoint to do what you don't naturally do or you're not so good at doing. So if you're not structured, you better make sure that your PowerPoint and your PowerPoint deck is really very structured and it helps the audience follow where you're going. You want it to show structure. If you're a little dry and maybe 
not so engaging because you're more in love with the content than you are with the audience, then maybe if you can get your PowerPoint to be a little warm or a little engaging or do, do things that will help you be warm and engaging or appear that way, that's, that's a good thing for you. And if you have trouble remembering the words that you want to say, then a little help from PowerPoint might be in order. So how does that work? What can you do? If you're a storyteller and a coach, there's some, there's some simple things. First of all, storytellers are usually pretty good. So in fact, they're so good that um, they, they usually mistake engagement in the audience for comprehension. That's the trouble with Bill, the CEO of the advertising network I told you about. So for the audience, they can literally be all over the map, and they can confuse people with their lack, lack of structure. So literally, creating PowerPoint decks, and I know there's a few people on the line that uh, create PowerPoint decks for a living, but if you can create a PowerPoint deck for a storyteller that is a simple map that shows the flow very clearly of how they, um, of the story they want to tell, it really helps the audience engage and follow along. And it can, it can basically bring them to new heights. If you're a coach, um, coaches can also use uh, maps and very structured decks. But one of the best things I've seen coaches do, so people are very uh, good at this, is they'll, they'll literally have a piece of paper in their hand with a two or three bullet points that they want to cover. or the, the, They'll have a very clear idea of the structure that they want to cover. And they'll get up and they'll talk in front of a piece of paper or a flip chart. And they have this idea of, you know, in a small group setting where they'll ask an audience a question, they'll jot down the answers on the easel, and they'll draw diagrams. And it doesn't even matter if they can write well or spell well. What the audience is seeing is the structure unfold in front of them as they go through each piece of paper on the flip chart. And literally, each piece of paper becomes point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, so you can see the structure of what they're going through. And it works well for a coach because they're actively engaging and doing as they're, as they're working through this. Another tip that works well for people that struggle with structure is just to actually say it up front. Um, I'm sure many people have seen TED. Have you ever seen uh, Lawrence Lessig on TED? He does this a lot, and he's very good at it. He'll say something like, I'm going to tell you three stories on the way to an argument. It's a, it's a really simple trick, but it's a, it's a, it, it's a great thing because you can you do two things. Number one, you tell your audience, what am I going to say and how am I going to say it? I'm going to give you three stories on the way to an argument. But you're reminding yourself up front that this is the path that I want to follow. So you don't go down all these different um, you know, cul-de-sacs that you might typically go down. Another simple thing, um, and this applies really in anyone that's building a structure for a presentation, is having a clear hook framing the meat, and, and then thinking about the payoff. Every presentation, every message has these three parts, a hook, meat, and payoff. And paying attention to that for storytellers and coaches is a great rule of thumb. What it does is it gives them a, a, a clear path to follow, and it allows them to fully, the audience, to fully engage, understand, and remember. Because you set a compelling hook, you've organized the meat of your content in a way that people can follow, and you're asking for payoff at the end. I'll say one more thing. And there are probably people that work for storytellers and coaches. And you'll recognize this cycle. Um, what will happen is you'll end up building um, a, a presentation for a storyteller or a coach. And it will happen like this. You'll have the first conversation three to four weeks before the big presentation. And they'll say, I need a deck on whatever. The, the, you know, the sales strategy that we're going to use in the next quarter or the new product release that we're going to do. I need a deck because I'm presenting to somebody. And you go away and you work busily on this uh, deck. And it's a beautiful piece of work. And it's fantastic. You've sweated hard over this thing. And you come back. And they'll turn around and say, no, 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 no. That's, that's not what I want at all. I didn't tell you to do that. I wanted to say this. And they'll, and they'll tell you, literally, what they wanted to say. And you get all about the fact that you don't really, you, you didn't get it. And they'll tell you to go and speak to this person and try this person. And they have a good point on that. And they have this information. And this conversation number two happens over and over again every three days as you keep coming back. And what's happening is the storyteller or the coach is really just 
they're trying to build structure. They don't, maybe they don't even realize that that's what they're doing, but they're having little practice conversations with you as they tell you what's wrong with the deck, because these little practice conversations help them build the structure and practice how they prepare. And that's what storytellers and coaches do to practice and prepare. Councils and teachers won't have that problem if you work for them. They'll actually give you a, a clear flow of what they want. What they're going to struggle with is engaging. They're going to struggle with providing this rich picture that the audience can live with. They're, they're going to struggle with tugging at the kind of emotional pieces that drive people to action. And that's because they're always going to naturally value content over connection. So anything your deck can do to help that connection is going to work for a counselor or a teacher. Um, so I'll give you an example. Kicking off that presentation with a question is a good idea. We work uh, a lot with the advertising marketing industry. And if, if you have or if you're in it, you'll know or you might guess that people in that industry are not a big fan of process. In fact, um, they really, you know, it wouldn't be too unkind to say they really don't, they hate process. So if you're a counselor and say you're the head of strategic planning and your side job is to roll out a process me methodology, a method for the whole company to work together, the strategic planners, the creatives, the account people, to work together across offices across the world on behalf of clients and it's a little bit structured and it smells like process, you're really working against a double whammy. Whammy number one is you know the people you're speaking to don't love process. And secondly, you're more in love with the idea than you are with the people in the audience, so how are you going to get this across? Well, a really simple trick and a really simple way is to go into the heart of the beast and ask a question up front. Who here likes process? You know the answer. No one. No one in that audience of advertisers and creatives likes process. They, they may see it as a necessary evil, but that's about it. Uh, but it's a great way to get the ball rolling. And, because you know that answer, you can, you're kind of admitting that you know that this is not going to be easy and you can start to talk about what the benefits of process are and how it can help and everything else. And, you, and you're at least beginning to engage. Another trick, obviously, with people that don't engage and connect as well is to really work on uh, rich pictures. Counselors and teachers can seem a little dry, so any trick they have that can help that engagement, rich and compelling pictures that tug at emotions and tell stories are a good thing. You know, uh, an example like this, you, you, if, you're, if you're talking about uh, a presentation and you know the content down cold, having a picture that obviously connects to whatever you're talking about, but is an interesting and, and kind of engaging picture, it's something that really works for you. If you have a fact, that's part of your presentation, something like there are 104 chemical elements in the known universe and 98 of them are in the New Jersey water supply. Putting, putting rich and compelling pictures behind those facts is a way for you to really engage as a, as a counselor or, or a teacher. And if you want to talk about customer service, Something that's very emotional and emotive as a, as a picture is a, a great way to go. They're very simple things to do, but especially if you're a counselor or a teacher, using these, again, PowerPoint, you may be a little dry, but the picture is not going to be behind you. Last point, and this is probably one of my uh, favorite tricks for counselors and teachers. Often people are dealing with four or five bullet points on the slide, and I know there are a lot of people that Give, will give you rules about how many bullet points you should put on a slide. But something like that we call verbal seasoning, and that's really just being human about your bullet points. It's not just going through and saying bullet one, bullet two, bullet three, bullet four, bullet five. It's turning around and saying, you know, I really like bullet three. This point here is my favorite thing. It's that, that fact is a completely content-free, useless piece of information, the fact that Maria likes bullet point number three. But the fact that Maria says bullet point number three is her favorite makes people think, well, Maria is a person after all. She has real people that she engages with, and she has favorites. She has likes and dislikes. I didn't really get that. 
it's a subconscious thing, but it works really well uh, for a counselor and a teacher just to add that verbal seasoning as they go through. Lastly, uh, there's a lot of, for counselors and teachers, there's a lot of new great technologies out there that can really begin to help. You know, if you're on a webinar, um, you can ask and engage and poll audiences. There's, there's also a great technologies like SlideCloud that allow you to poll and ask questions of very large audiences in real time. And I think as those technologies develop, you'll see counselors and teachers especially wanting to take those up because they really will help them engage and interact uh, with audiences as they work through. So last but not least are these coordinators and inventors, the great majority of us, and we struggle with words. Um, we'd love to be able to use PowerPoint like a teleprompter, but we know that's a really bad idea. So the trick is, how do we get PowerPoint to remember our words? And how do we get it without putting everything we want to say up on a script in front of us? And how do we do it in a way that we feel comfortable? And once you've learned how to do this, the days of sweating bullets over your presentation are, are over. There's a few simple things. First of all, <clears throat> I, would, I would say this, don't try. If you have some, something that's a nice to have in your presentation, that you think is a great phrase, a great turn of phrase, something that sounds really good, and you are working really hard to commit it to memory, the chances are when you get to that moment where you have to remember it, it's 50-50 whether you do. And even in the act of trying to remember, looking up, looking away, whatever it is you do that try to remember, you're going to look tentative. So unless it really is going to help you, say you want to uh, insert a quote from Churchill because somehow you think that Churchill quote really connects into the presentation that you're giving, but you, you struggle remembering it, don't even bother. No one in the audience knew that that was your intention in the first place unless it's up there on the slide. So anything that you don't need to put up there, don't bother. And if there was a part of the presentation that you missed, just that they don't know that you missed it. I would say this, though. If you do need to have that type of thing in, then what you need to do is work really hard at taking that, uh, that point down to the smallest nugget you can, you can put up there. Because all you need as a coordinator or an inventor is a little breadcrumb to help you follow the path along to help you unleash your words, to give you a trigger phrase that will work for you. And if you do that, then there's a very simple um, triad that works, and it's this. Literally, click, comment, and connect. So if, you, if it's absolutely positively essential that you remember this key point, you put it down, and maybe you've got that phrase from Churchill, the uh, two nations divided by a common language, and then you go through the sequence, click, comment, connect. Click, you know, if you're a coordinator or an inventor, using builds so you don't put the whole slide up at once is a very useful thing. So you click to show the next bullet or the next point, the next build on your slide. It helps you navigate the flow of the conversation and the presentation. Comment, you quickly glance at whatever came up after you clicked and see what it says, and then you comment about it. Because the fact is you know your stuff you just are a little leery about whether you'll have the right word or the right phrase. Well, something approximating it is up there on the slide. You comment on it. You say what you know, the fact that when I'm talking about two nations divided by common language, that's similar to the situation we've got going on between sales and marketing. We really have two different, we've really got a similar worldview, but we're talking about different things. You say whatever it is you want to know. And then lastly, you connect. And when you say connect, when I say connect, I mean you connected to a previous point you've made and or you connected to someone in the audience. So John, this is similar to the situation you had last week when. And that click, comment, connect, that little trifecta takes a little practice, but with it you can navigate through any deck, any presentation, seem really fluid and natural and engage and connect with the audience. So we I've quickly gone through the presenter types and, and given you a few points, and I wanted to leave time for questions because we're really just dipping our toe into this, but I want to wrap up uh, with this. The first point is, if you're not you, if you're trying to be someone else, then you're, you're really on a non-starter. You have to be you. If you want to get better, if you want to win more business, if you want to get promoted, create a following. Me trying to be like Rose, 
bad idea. You trying to be like Steve Jobs, bad idea. Be you. To do that, you have to understand who you are. And if you look at these six presenter types, you'll figure out who you are, and you'll figure out what your strengths are, what your natural tendencies are, what your biases are, and they're the starting point to getting better. Everyone that's been on this webinar will email you a link to a quick survey, a quick self-diagnosis tool. Uh, it takes literally less than five minutes, and it'll confirm your presenter type, and you'll get a little one-pager describing that in more detail. So you'll know who you are as a presenter. Third point, you and PowerPoint, you and Keynote, you and SlideCloud, you and the flip chart that you're using are a double act. Use it to support you. If you're not funny, PowerPoint should be funny. If you're not structured, PowerPoint should be structured. If you're not engaging, build it in a way that engages. And that will really relieve a lot of the you know, stress uh, about presenting. It will also really help you be a lot better as a presenter. And last point is, once you know all this, it's a really, really all, all about paying attention to what you need. Words, pictures, or structure. They're the three parts that go wrong for different types of people. Whether you're build, building a presentation for other people, whether you're present, building it for yourself, knowing what you need to pay attention to will, will really help you. So we've just dipped our toe in the water today. A powerful point is a system that helps you or your business communicate better, and it really does hinge around these core ideas. Being you, what are the types of presenter, the fact that you and whatever tool you're using are a double act, and what you need to pay attention to in this trifecta of words, pictures, and structure. That's uh, pretty much it for, the, for this kind of formal part of this webinar. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for taking the time to listen. I do appreciate it. And uh, if anyone's got any questions, I'll hand it back to Sharon and, and we'll work them from there. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. That was great. Very informative. We are ready to take questions now. We have a few that have already come in. But please type in your questions into the question panel in your GoToWebinar uh, Q&A feature. So let's start with this question, Gavin. Doesn't the audience play a role in which kind of present, presenter you are at the moment? Can you be more than just one or two types? Um, I think the audience always plays a role, but I, doesn't, I don't think it changes the type of presenter you are. I think how you present and engage to an audience um, changes depending on the circumstance. So if you're a storyteller or a coach, for instance, if you're a coach and you're working in a, in a small room of 20 people, it's very easy for you to work with an easel and a marker and engage and interact with the audience. If you're in a room with 150, you still need to engage and interact with the audience, but you can't really do it with an easel and a, and a marker. You have to do it in a different way. So I would say, yes, absolutely, the audience has an impact. I think it's more that I think also the circumstance and the tools you have available have an impact. But who you are at your core, that really doesn't change. What you do to take advantage of the circumstance, that's what changes. Great. Thank you. Um, next question. What's the evidence that better presenters win more business? How do you know that? It's the stats that tend to convince people. The stats about better presenters win more business. There's a, there's a, there's a couple of interesting things, and what I'll do is I'll I'll dig up the research and um, uh, I'll see if I can get it amended to, if not the first email that comes out, but the second. Uh, I won't have this exactly off the top of my head, but there's some research that's come out of, um, I, 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 I want to say the University of Manchester, but I think that's wrong in the UK, where they've done a lot of research into um, the basic skills that salespeople have. And a big part of that, that skill base that salespeople have is how they present and, and, and talk to uh, their clients or their potential customers. And th I think they surveyed over 300 salespeople in different roles, both in telesales, field sales, in, and I think it was, it was pretty much in all B2B environments. But that basically said and confirms what I think most people intuitively know, that it that is a key skill that presenters need. They need to be able to 
at the end of the day, salespeople really only do two things. They understand and translate what the requirements of their customer are, and they translate what their business can do for that customer. That translation of what their business can do for that customer is that, is that skill of presenting. Great. Another great answer. We have another question. Um, before I ask this question, I'm just going to mention again that we will be sending a follow-up email to everyone with a link to the uh, short survey that Gavin mentioned, the self-diagnostic tool. But this question is, are there any tools available to determine and identify what type of presenter you are? I'm assuming they either didn't hear that we were going to do that, or are there additional tools that you could recommend? Well, we've we've literally we've just been, I, you know as I go through this uh, webinar, I realize how much I say the word literally. But we have just um, made uh, this uh, tool. It's a, a probably three. I think it's three questions uh, and a shuffling of some answers. Uh, you can see the URL in front of you: uh, map.fastforward.com/guest. That takes you to that, and that will um, it will it will confirm the survey. The survey will confirm what type you are. I would say we've been in, we've used this with clients uh, in private sessions for the last year, and it's been about 90% accurate. Um, the other way you can tell is, uh, you know, once you get used to this, once you understand these types, you can, you can start to look at people and what they typically do and what their tendencies are, it's like having a tell in poker, and you can, you almost know what they are. It's difficult sometimes to tell the difference between counselors and teachers. Storytellers really stand out. Inventors really stand out. But yeah, I'd say the the the, uh, the diagnosis tool is the way to go. All right. Uh, another question: What's the best way to feel comfortable and deal with your nerves? I think the best way to feel comfortable and deal with your nerves, again, goes back to depend on your type. If you're, an, um, if you're an inventor, you, you have to build your, and, and it's the, say it's the first time you're doing a big presentation, don't let anyone else build, build the deck for you. Make sure you build the deck, or if you don't have quite the skills you need, be as involved as possible in building the deck. Um, I would then say the other thing, you, the other thing that really helps you uh, as an inventor in calming your nerves is treating it like a conversation rather than a presentation. Because, uh, you know, again, inventors work much better in Q&A, so really what they want to do is make the presentation as much like a conversation as they can, and that idea of click, comment, connect is a good way of calming nerves. If you're a storyteller, the under, other end of the spectrum, you're really not going to have too many nerves about what you do. You may be nervous if you get put in, put in situations where you can't tell stories. Um, that may be difficult for you. If you're doing a, um, let's say, a, a, a Wall Street uh, kind of financial review and you, you, you know story tell, stories are not going to work so well there, then that might be a little bit no, more nervous for you. But typically, a storyteller is not going to have that kind of problem. Thank you, Gavin. Um, I have a couple of questions that have come in um, in regards to the deck. What theme did you use? Um, did you customize your own images? Or did oh, someone the deck make them just, for you? The deck we just did now, uh, the deck I just showed on the webinar, I assume. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, this was, uh, it was done in-house. We do um, quite a lot of, uh, a lot of clients ask it because, well, let me start by answering it this way. We're, a, we're actually a consulting firm that, and we do business transformation. At the heart of business transformation is changing people's minds. And changing people's minds is about communicating. So over the last 10 to 12 years, we've got a lot better at doing that. We've had to build a capacity to build decks. We, so we did this in-house. Uh, we do that a lot for, for clients uh, of ours where we'll build decks for them. Uh, there was no theme. Uh, it was the, the, the opening drawing, this drawing here, um, was uh, done by uh, Catherine, uh, who's uh, new new to us this summer, and thank you, Catherine, for doing this. And then a lot of the other work was basically done in Illustrator and imported into PowerPoint, and we, it's, it's a style we typically use because we find it's, um, it's very easy to understand and use. It's, it's just done on a plain white background. 
Well, I think it's great. Thanks, Gavin. Here's another question. Many non-native English speakers have to give presentations in English. What advice would you give those people? Um, that's a tough one. The first thing I would say is every English speaker in the audience, every native English speaker in the audience, um, the, the chances are they don't they're not going to speak uh, that second language that you speak, and they will absolutely absolutely sympathize with the fact that you are out there speaking in English. If you, I speak a little bit of French, and if you got me to speak in, in French in an audience, I'd be uh, horrified by the fact that I have to do it. But I know I would get a lot of sympathy and empathy by trying. So I think that's the first thing there. Um, the other thing I think they really need to do is keep the slides simple. And I think if you're a, if you're a, if you if you think about your slides as a series of points, just have one point per slide. So if you're making a presentation and you want to cover, you know, you have a hook, meet and payoff. You you open with whatever your hook is. It's a couple of points that you want to make. Organize it very simply. One key point per slide. I wouldn't put a lot of language on the slide. But I would work on getting that that point to a very simple sentence, and then and then talk around that. Because again, don't forget, if you and PowerPoint are a double act, and you're worried about you can't get the meaning across. Make sure the meaning is carried in the slide. Thanks, Gavin. Another question: Who has influenced you in this arena, and how? This person um, is this person's a fan of some uh, people named Gar Reynolds and John Medina. Yeah, um, I would say, I would say uh, it, it, it's a wide variety of people. Um, in terms of Rose, definitely because what I've been able to do in working with her is basically observe someone who's naturally good at it but doesn't know why they're so good, and I think that's been an extremely useful lesson for me. Um, I think. Uh, there's some great uh, authors and speakers and consultants in this area. I think Gar Reynolds is is very good, um, and I've been following what he's been doing for a while. Um, I I like a lot of what Edward Tufte has to say in terms of the way you display information. Uh, I think Nancy Duarte has really done some phenomenal work in the areas of presentation. Um, I also think uh, Dan Rome, who is published a couple of books, uh, blah, 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 and Back of the Napkin, around how do you kind of express yourself visually is a really interesting. And then I think um, a lot of it's just by observation of, of other people who are good and, and what they do. I, I follow, you know, if you look at SlideShare a lot, if you look at what's going on on TED, you can, you can, uh, you can see. But I would say they're the main influences. Uh, another question. I think we have time for a few more. Um, sure. Can you describe SlideCloud a little more as the tool that you mentioned? Yeah, SlideCloud is a, a startup um, that um, I, I basically bumped into uh, one of the co-founders of SlideCloud on Twitter. Probably I was, you know, I was tweeting about something to do with PowerPoint, or he was too, and we talked about this idea of. Um, you know, one of the one of the things I'm interested in is I think people 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 need to engage more in presentations. I think a lot of people view it as a check off the box exercise. And when I was talking to SlideCloud, and you can go to their uh, website, I, it's spelled slide as you would normally think it's spelled, and then cloud k l o k l o w d dot com, and they basically have a a tool where you can take a PowerPoint you've already built in PowerPoint, load it into SlideCloud, and you it, it runs so you have um, a big screen in a seminar uh, running off looking like PowerPoint, and you also have everyone in the audience that has a smartphone or a tablet or an iPad also running and looking at that same screen. And then you can, uh, you can make SlideCloud ask questions, poll the audience, do all this kind of stuff that's very interactive and engaging while you're actually in the thing. I think it's fantastic for uh, conference events and those types of things. Very interesting tool. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on with a lot of different technology stuff.
startups trying to do something in this space. And I think that's one of the more interesting ones. Thank you, Gavin. Let's see. Let's check the time. And we have time for maybe uh, one more question. So if you have any questions, sure. please feel free to type them in. Um, here's another question, Gavin. Uh, now that I know what type of presenter I am, how do I go about getting better? <laughs> well, it's, it's like they say about Carnegie Hall, at the end of the day it's practice. I would say there's a couple of things that work really well. You, you, if, you, if you do things that are always well inside your comfort zone, you will not get better. You, you have to go, you can't go beyond your comfort zone. And I think knowing your presenter type allows you to work at the edge of your comfort zone. And that's, that's how you really get better. Um, depending on your presenter type, you know whether you've got to work on structured words or pictures. Working on those, you know, re really, to be honest, uh, the structure and pictures piece are, are easy because you can do them before you do the presentation. It's the words piece that's uh, more difficult because you really only practice those things live. Um, but it's really practice. We also, um, some people have asked us to uh, help them. Uh, we've we've had people, we've had, you know, marketing and advertising executives who've had to do presentations in China and all other places and we'll build decks for them. We've had people come to us and said, you know, I, I really need to, I've got a big thing coming up or I'm doing a board presentation and I need coach or I need help on doing that. We, we, we do do that for people. Um, but really, I'd say, you know, if you're working on your own and you want to get better, there's two things you can really do. Number one, really pay attention to structured words or pictures, whichever one it is for you. Number two, work at the end of your, work at the edge of your comfort zone, not beyond it, and not safely in the middle of it. And number three, just look at what other people do, because you can always see and and pick out once you know your type, pick out what you think is going to work for you. Thank you, Gavin. I think that's all the time we have for today. I just wanted to say that we hope you found uh, the presentation helpful in bringing you uh, closer to becoming a better presenter. And uh, we highly recommend that you take the survey as a supplement to the webinar. Um, it will be a great follow-up. And uh, again, we will be sending this link out to everyone in a follow-up email um, along with some other information to help you on your way to becoming a better presenter. Thank you, Gavin. We appreciate Thanks, you being. Yes, it was wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. No problem. I enjoyed it. Thank Th you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending our webinar. Have a wonderful day.